welcome everyone to Africam for Good, brought to you by Explore.org. Thank you for joining us today. We will be having a discussion on one of Africa's most mysterious creatures, the pangolin. Today, I'm joined by the co-chairperson of the African Pangolin Working Group, Director of Joburg Wildlife Vets and Project Manager for HSI Africa, Nikki Wright. It's great to have her on the show today to discuss the amazing work she's been doing with pangolins and pangolin conservation here in Africa. Hi, Nikki. Thank you for joining us on the show. Hi, Russell. Thanks very much for having me. It's our great pleasure. So, as always, we kick off the show with you introducing yourself. So, tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and what you do. Well, I am a wildlife rehabilitation specialist, which um, involves working with all indigenous wildlife species. And there are a couple that I specialize in and that I'm particularly fond of. Uh, One of those are... Um, is the pangolin. So, um, yeah, and with the the pangolin poaching increasing and more and more being brought off the trade, um, especially in South Africa, we found ourselves at the cutting edge of uh, pangolin veterinary medicine and also pangolin rehab and release. Awesome. And I mean, it's quite a a daunting task, of course, any sort of animal conservation in this day and age. What made you decide to get into conservation work? I think I'm one of those lucky people, Russell, who's known what um, I've wanted to do since I was about four. Um, And it's always involved rescuing wildlife, making them better and letting them go again. So it's just kind of progressed from from a four-year-old's little vision to uh, running a wildlife hospital together with my business partner, Dr. Corinne Lawrence. Awesome. Well, that's that's always nice when we can (laughs) chase those dreams. I have to say I had kind of similar... Similar life. I I was very keen on becoming a marine scientist. I ended up in the bush a little bit more often than I expected. But again, you know, chasing the dream sometimes does exactly. does work. But yeah. tell us about the African Pangolin Working Group. Um, what what work do you and your team do over there? So the African Pangolin Working Group was started in 2011. Um, our fun, founder was uh, Professor Ray Janssen, who saw integrally in, involved with the African Pangolin Working Group. And it started because we um, realized that, they were, that pangolin were in trouble, basically. Um, I had the first pangolin that I ever handled put into my arms in 2008, and that was the first traffic pangolin that I'd ever dealt with. So from there, it's just been increasing. Um, and we formed the African Pangolin Working Group so that we could learn as much as we could about pangolin. We could do as many rescues um, and and rehabilitation and releases of of the rescued ones as we could, um, but also to do as much research because, you know, if a species is in trouble, you need to know about them before you can um, do the best job in treating them from a veterinary perspective and also the rehabilitation and the release process. You need to know. And not much had been done on pangolin before. So, um, in fact, we're still learning every day. They're, They're such a... A unique species that um, yeah every, every day they surprise us so that's basically why the pangolin working group um, was formed and then of course down the line we've um, formed amazing collaborations with um, like the Johannesburg Veterinary Hospital and um, various other people government departments SAPS the Hawks um, all the relevant um, law enforcement bodies um, and it's an incredible team that that operates for pangolin throughout South Africa and Africa, actually. Yeah, it is amazing. I mean, as you said, it's a huge collaboration of what's going on. When I think about starting guiding, I started working as a guide way back in 2004. Uh, you know, almost no guests would ever ask about seeing a pangolin. You know, most people had no idea what it was, or, you know, they were there for the big five and a couple of giraffe and zebra, all wonderful things. But people just didn't think about it. Do you still find that some people, have never heard of a pangolin before or has, or do you think yes. there's been increased awareness about them in recent documentaries, social media, etc.? There are still some people obviously that, that have never heard of pangolin. Um, but, but thankfully the majority have. And I think that really kicked off in um, uh, when we had CITES, cop, cop, uh, what was it? 16, I think it was, or 17 here in Johannesburg. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, of course, the media around uh, pangolin was huge globally, but also locally. 
um, because we were all pushing for pangolin to be uh, put into Appendix 1, so there was no trade breeding or anything allowed with them. And I think that really kick-started this whole media ball, you know, and, and the poor species or the poor order, in fact, all eight species um, found themselves in the global spotlight, both from a media point of view, but also be because they were the most heavily perched mammal on Earth. Yeah, again, I think a, a, a thing that not a lot of people out there actually know how, how trafficked they are. Um, but yeah. again, you know, just, just to focus a little on, on the animals themselves, for those out there, you know, a lot of our viewers, we never really see them on the cameras, you know, on Africam. Um, they're so rare, you know, in many, many areas that you, they just don't come into those areas. But for those watching, you know, can you tell us a little bit about them and the threats they're currently facing? Okay, so, um, you know, pangolin are um, a quiet, shy, um, benign, uh, nocturnal animal. They're the only scaled mammal on Earth. So they're this mystical-looking creature. They, they look like they've just stepped out of a, a book of myths and legends. You know, they look like a, a mini dragon. Um, and they're very shy and very quiet. They have no natural predators. Although a, a honey badger or a hyena would definitely take a, a young pangolin that wasn't able to hold itself rolled up in a ball. Um, and the, 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 their main predator, of course, is, is us, the two-leggeds, unfortunately. Um, and since um, this whole spike in, in um, trafficking, you know, which is mainly for the Asian traditional medicine market, um, their decline is, is huge. And, and, and the unfortunate thing is that you can't count pangolins because they're like ghosts. You know, we, you don't know where they, where they are in the bush and the felt and um, the forests of Africa. So you can't actually count them like you can elephant or rhino, for example, mm -hmm. from the sky. So um, it makes it very, very difficult to know how many are left. Um, yeah, in 2019, there was 97 tons of African pangolin scales intercepted going into Asia. So that is only the amount that were intercepted. And that uh, is equivalent to about 160,000 animals, which is just, it, it's just mind blowing. I mean, the numbers are just devastating. Um, so because the Asian yeah. species declined, they now have uh, turned their focus onto our species. Um, you know, and they're, they're, they're very well um, organized, you know, syndicates, wildlife crime mm -hmm. uh, syndicates um, operating throughout Africa and out. Yeah, I mean, the numbers are, are staggering. And to, to think mm -hmm. of that number of animals and you consider, again, being out in the bush, you know, I've spent the majority of my adult life in the bush and can count on on two hands the amount of times I've seen pangolin in the wild, you know, on out on safari and it's unbelievable that there's so many being being trafficked like that um how do they how do they do it you know how are penguins being captured by these poachers and and then getting them all around the world um well initially i think um you know in the bushmeat markets of west and central africa the uh, pangolin is a traditional um item on that on the bushmeat market um, and so for, for many years, the scales would be taken off, the meat would be cooked and sold, and the scales were just a byproduct. They were just piles of pangolin scales, you know, on the side of the roads and forests and, and all over um, those areas of uh, pangolin range states. And then I suppose somebody with an interest in scales and selling them came along and, and offered money for them. And that's how those initial huge um, amounts were, were um, gathered. And um, now I think... Uh, those have probably been used up to a large extent, uh, possibly a bit more collected over COVID because, you know, everything was closed, the courts um, were closed. Um, but now you have people actually uh, going out and, and hunting them for the scales. Uh, the scales have become the primary thing and the meat the secondary thing, I think. So, um, I mean, if you're, if you're somebody that, uh, you know, like a herdsman um, who just spends all day out in the, out in the felt or in the bush, with your goats or cattle, you know what where every single animal is. You know where the birds nest, where the snakes are, where the water is, um, and they will know exactly where uh, pangolins that go into burrows or live up in trees are. Yeah. They're, they're within that 
uh, animal's territory. So when a guy comes along and offers him a hundred bucks to show him where the pangolin is, he'll, you know, often take it because these people are living on the bread line. Um, but it's become a little bit more sophisticated than that as well, where um, these poachers have got dogs trained um, to find pangolins. So there are, there are syndicates operating with pangolin um, trained dogs that find the pangolins in the burrows and dig them up. So um, that's happening as well. It's just becoming, you know, more and more sophisticated. Um, and uh, yeah, that's how they find them basically. It's interesting. And do you feel like it's getting worse or do you think more education and intervention is helping to, to reduce the number of, of penguins being poached or trafficked? I, I don't know that it's getting any better. I don't think so. Mm -hmm. um, I think that education does go a long way, but um, there are also people out there that are, you know, trying to keep life together. Um, so from a, from, from a, a socioeconomic standpoint, I think people are driven to make ends meet no matter which way they can, um, in any way they can. And I think that is a problem. Um, I do think that, um, I think that a lot of the elders and traditional healers and um, traditional leaders of communities and um, um, different um, tribes throughout Africa are only now becoming aware through education that Pangolin is in trouble. Um, and a lot of these tribes and people, especially, um, you know, there are, are, are communities in South Africa, in Zimbabwe, that hold Pangolin very, very in, in, in high regard. They revere the animal. And they've had no idea when you've gone to speak to these people, they've been horrified and devastated by what they've heard because they, you know, they don't have access to, to the media at large like we do or like city people have. And so um, I think that a, a, good, um, a good way to approach it would be from the ground and, and from the top down. So, you know, getting hold of the old elders and seeing if they, can, if they can help us in the conservation of the species. Yeah, I think, you know, with all the, all the wonderful conservationist scientists um, that we've spoken to on this particular show over the last few months, it seems to be the general trend that, you know, the, any, the, the best way of, of get, seeing success in any of these projects has been the involvement of the local communities and, the, and a lot of the passion and drive for, uh, for the animals actually coming from those communities uh, that may have been previously involved in, in, in the actual poaching of them. So that is definitely a positive that I've noticed uh, across the board that there's been a lot more involvement of, of the, the local communities and surrounding communities for, for these animals. Yeah, that's encouraging. It's really encouraging. Yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll see more of that with, with you guys and the Pangnans. And I know there are positive things and you guys do incredible, incredible work. You know, you, you mentioned the Johannesburg wildlife veterinary clinic where you guys treat and re rehabilitate pangolins. Yes. Um, how yes. hard is it to rehabilitate a pangolin? Well, I must just mention uh, right off the bat that the, the pangolins are treated here, but not kept here at the Johannesburg wildlife vet of it okay. for, for obvious safety and security reasons. So they're kept off site mm -hmm. in a secure location. Um, and the Johannesburg wildlife vet uh, has been uh, running for about four, four and a half years. And, um, the vets here have become world leaders in pangolin medicine. I've seen the most incredible things go on here, you know, blood transfusions of, of com for compromised pangolins, things that haven't been done before because we haven't had this crisis with pangolin before. So these are all firsts that are happening. Um, and we've also learned, of course, from, um, you know, Vietnam and other Asian countries which have been doing a lot with pangolins because they were the first ones to start getting um, compromised pangolins in off the legal trade in, in Asia. Um, so there have been all sorts of collaborations back and forth as well. Um, so what it's like, uh, you, get, um, you get a message come through off the WhatsApp, on WhatsApp saying that a sting operation has been successful. Um, the police and all the other law enforcement officers have moved in. They've retrieved a pangolin. They've made 
however many arrests, and the pangolin gets brought through to the hospital because that's where it's mandated by government to come for treatment initially. Um, and we all stand by with bated breath, hoping that the pangolin isn't too compromised because they've often been kept in captivity by the poachers for 10 days or two weeks without food, without water, sometimes tied into a sack. We had one recently that was um, uh, put into the, the spare tire well of a vehicle and the spare tire put down on top and, she was, and it was tightened in on top of her. You know, so these animals are kept like that for, for how ever many days or weeks even uh, while they're brought, you know, from place to place to place until they get to the meeting spot where the, the deal, so-called, is going to go off. And, um, and then we have a three-day uh, treatment protocol which the pangolins um, undergo just to hydrate them, to give them some really um, easy to digest uh, food which is tube fed into their stomach because they're often extremely emaciated. So it would be like giving somebody who's starving, really properly starving and, and skinny and thin, it would be like sitting them down to a huge Christmas dinner. They wouldn't manage it. So they need a smoothie, yeah. you know, and that's what we're giving the pangolins. Um, and then also just letting, just letting them rest because they haven't been able to sleep properly while they've been mm. haggled over and hauled around in their sack or the bag or what, whatever they're in. Um, so it's basically just to let them be, feel better and catch their breath. And then on the fourth day, we take them walking, depending on, on their physical condition, of course. And we take the walking so that they can feed because they don't feed in captivity. Um, and we've got a, a very secure off-site location again, again where we walk with them, where, which has several different species of ants. And we just monitor those pangolins and see how they are and see, you know, they're all different personalities. Um, some are really strong and stroppy and they want to kill you with their tails because you hold them, they're rolled up and their tail comes around like this and they're holding it at this angle and they whop, whop, whop and try and bash you. And they are so strong, really very strong. Um, and their scales can cut you as well. And others are very, very sweet personalities. They're curious and they, um, yeah, you can't believe how sweet they can be after such a horrific ordeal. So that's how we start working with them and then um, gradually get their health um, up and their fitness levels up. And when, they, when they've been given the veterinary all clear, then they go into the next phase. Okay, cool. And the next phase is then release them back into the wild. And then I believe you guys use telemetry to, to monitor them. Um, you know, you must have seen some interesting behaviors once they'd been released as well from, from that information coming back from from the telemetry huge we've learned so much so every yeah. single pangolin gets two types of telemetry put on we put a satellite tag and we put a vhf tag on the vhf is a very high frequency and the satellite tag obviously um, you can set it um, and when the pangolins are initially released we set it to go off and um, to give us a, a, a point like every hour or so um, and when that downloads, you can see exactly where that pangolin's been. So we have a very strict um, release protocol, uh, which involves a lot of monitoring and a lot of weighing. So weighing is the only way that you can really tell if the animal's um, feeding properly or not. Um, and then when, so that will go on for about four or five days, and then it'll be released with its telemetry, and then they, they we watch them. Wherever the release site is, the team on the ground, because there's always another team involved who does the releases and the monitoring. They'll watch to see where that pangolin's going. And what you want to see is you want to see them starting to walk in sort of circular movements um, and you want to see them finding a nice burrow um, and, and just generally behaving themselves like that. What you don't want to see is the pangolin just trekking up for eight kilometers and landing up on the other side Into of the, the game sunset. Yeah. Yes, yeah, then that has Fair to go enough. and be... Yeah and you start all over again until they settle or find a different area that that pangolin might might like because of course we don't know exactly where all these pangolins come from and we don't know the different habitats some prefer copies and rocky areas others prefer open grasslands they're all different so we have to gauge from the behavior that they that they're showing what they like and try and fit fit in with them of course okay well that's really 
really interesting. And I mean, with all your time working with them, you, you must have had some really wonderful memories. What do you think has been one of your highlights working with pangolins? Ugh. There are so many, you know, I mean, every day you just can't believe that you're working with this amazing creature. It's just, it really yeah. is like that. Um, there are two that particularly stand out for me. Um, one is that we've been involved with the reintroduction of Tenex pangolin back into KwaZulu-Natal, um, which is an area where they were locally extinct. They hadn't been seen for three or four decades there. Um, and we've, we've been working very closely with two private reserves down there to reintroduce them. And it has it has just been the most incredible experience to see how all of those animals have, have done. Um, in fact, to the point where we've had now two pups born on the one reserve, one pup oh, was awesome. born, uh, the mother was pregnant when she left the hospital. So she was pregnant when she was retrieved off the, off the trade, managed to retain her, her pup and uh, gave birth down there in, in the wild. So we were all ecstatic about that. And now there's been another pup born, which is, is the product of, of mating with one of the, the males that we had released previously. So that's like a proper wild pup uh, product yeah. of two rehabilitated program, uh, 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 pangolins. So that's just, that's like wonderful. We're ecstatic. And the same sort of thing happened up in Limpopo as well um, with a pangolin okay. called Ali. She was pregnant. She gave birth in the wild and now she's just given birth to her second pup with a wild male. So we're thrilled about that. Absolutely thrilled. So that was the, that's the one. That's the second highlight. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's incredible. As you say, I mean, it's always nice to have these kinds of positive stories. It's a, you know, as we spoke about the beginning of our chat today, conservation is difficult. You know, and in the world at the moment, there's not a lot of positives, and we always have to look for those. You know, when we talk about conservation, because it makes it all worthwhile. So it's what keeps us going. It was, I mean, I don't know. I think we're all slightly crazy, but that definitely keeps us going. Those <laughs> highlights. And, you know, you just work for each pangolin, do the best we can for each pangolin that comes into our hands. And when they go on and finish the job that beautifully, it's just wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Well, we couldn't do it without people like you. Um, but there might be some others out there who would be keen on getting involved. How can people help with pangolin conservation? I think they could um, go onto um, the websites of both the African Pangolin Working Group and the Johannesburg mm -hmm. Wildlife Vet. Um, send an email, you know, reach out in that way. I think that's a good start. Um, yeah, I think that would be a good start. I mean, if people are looking to sponsor things, they can, they can send an email and ask what it is that we need awesome. sponsoring. Telemetry is always, I mean, it's expensive. Um, it costs us mm -hmm. uh, close to 30,000 Rand per pang pangolin um, for the telemetry. So that, that's always a huge help if we can get assistance with that. But there are so many ways people can, can help. So it's just best, I think, to drop us a line. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure that the, everyone can reach you and we'll get that information to them. And maybe there's some budding pangolin conservationists or scientists Absolutely. Out there, you never we, know. yeah we, we need them we need them and pangolins need them <laughs> yeah. yeah absolutely what are some of your hopes for the future in regards to pangolins that people stop thinking these scales have got medicinal powers you know these animals are not magic animals they and I know it's extremely difficult to change opinions that have been around since 800 AD. You know, that's how far back the medicinal use of pangolin scale goes. Um, and it's extremely difficult to change that. But um, the, the, the nouveau riche in Asia and um, up and coming people are using pangolins as status symbols. That can be stopped. There, there are incredible organizations globally who, who do amazing work with Asian uh, influences to to change the mindsets of the younger generations who may be um, you know looking into using pangolins as a as a status symbol for instance which a lot goes a lot a lot of that happens so um, I think globally there are incredible people doing a lot of work for pangolin and that really gives me so much hope you know when we're sort of down the rabbit hole of trying to save this life and that life um, or, or um, going to court cases and testifying in, in aggravation of sentencing and 
you know, that is all really tough, grimy work, but very satisfying mm. and, and necessary. Um, and if we just lift our heads a little bit, we can see other groups out there that are doing incredible work. Um, and it helps us to feel, feel supported on the ground as well. So that gives me hope for Anglin. There are a lot of wonderful people out there working for them. Well, thank you. And I couldn't agree more. I think you guys are doing incredible stuff out there and long may it continue and hopefully we'll run into you again and chat to you again in the future. I'm sure we will. With pleasure. With pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for chatting with us today, Nikki. It was so interesting talking to you about an animal many wouldn't even have heard of before today, let alone their current plight in global conservation. Um, hopefully we get lucky enough to catch one of them on the cameras at some point. Uh, I'm sure a lot of our viewers out there would be very keen to see. If we do get some cool new behaviors, we'll be sure to send that to you so that you can have a look for yourself. But thanks again for joining us. It's a pleasure. Thanks very much for having me. And thank you all once again for watching the show. Please join us again next week for African for Good, brought to you by explore.org. Don't forget to subscribe to stay informed for any of our upcoming shows. Uh, but for now, it's cheers from all of us.